You're watching the Luca Rosano Show. Here's your host, Luca Rosano. Welcome, everybody, to the Luca Rosano Show, presented by Dave and Buster's Vaughn. I'm here with a very special guest, former NBA player and former Toronto Raptor, Jerome Junkyard Dog Williams. How's it going, man? Dog town. We're in the building. Luca was happy. I'm super excited to have you, man. As somebody who watched you as a kid, to be able to talk to you now in person or over Zoom, of course, it, it, this is surreal. So um, before we get started here, I just want to ask, how are you doing, man? How's uh, life now in Vegas as normality seems to set in a bit? Well, you know what? Life is good, man. You always got to look at the positives and look on the bright side of everything. There's a, there's a, you know, a green light to every red light that you get in life. So make sure you know you just you just pass through yellow and you know get to the green so i think you know everything everything is good just praying for a lot of families out there loved ones um obviously who who have been affected by the, the covid-19 um you know many businesses and and people so you know just really just uh taking the time to try to comfort those who are in need that's awesome yeah hopefully you know uh, things do get back to normal and uh, we can live life as we used to, of course. Uh, Jerome, I want to talk about your uh, NBA career here. Um, so, you know, you spent nine years in the league. You played for four teams, Knicks, Bulls, My Raptors, and the Detroit Pistons. Um, of course, we all watched The Last Dance. I want to get your opinion and uh, your experience playing against the GOAT Michael Jordan. I mean, how was he as a competitor through your eyes? You know, it was it was tremendous uh, watching the last dance because uh, it brought up so many memories of Mike and, uh, you know, being able to see him behind the scenes. You know, Mike was a, a very, you know, obviously one of the greatest competitors, um, if not the greatest uh, competitor of all time. He, uh, when I played against him, it was just a level of excitement, um, one from the standpoint of, you know, him being Michael Jordan, but also from the standpoint of I had posters of his in my house, you know, growing up as a kid and and uh, seeing the competitive nature that he won his championships with when I was in high school and then ultimately going on his second tenure of um, out of retirement, three-peat when I got into the league. It was just surreal. Like, uh, you know, this guy, when he's out there on the court, he doesn't talk trash. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything until, you know, something is said to him. He's just like, just like the videos portrayed, like do not activate Mike. And everybody has their stories. Um, I remember we were up 20 going into the fourth quarter and I turned to one of the, one of the veterans on my bench and I said, yo, we're going to win this game. And he just said, you know, no, you know, Mike is getting ready to turn it on. And I was like, I just, I just couldn't fathom. We had the momentum. We had the crowd. It was in Detroit. I was like, there's no way, you know, this, and sure enough, you know, Mike had like 14 um, up until that point. He ended the game with like 38 and they won. <laughs> and uh, it's just like, good Lord, did I just witness what happened? Because that's the one thing, you know, a lot of a lot of NBA players can can score with you toe to toe. You know, they can get high, you can get high, but yeah. he can defend, you know, and when he turned on defensively, it was, you know, it was just another level. So, yeah, Michael Jordan, he's uh, he's the GOAT. Yeah, that must have been amazing for you to uh, begin your NBA career uh, with the Pistons, going through some of those battles that you did, of course, going against Michael Jordan. Uh, let's switch here now to the, uh, you know, the second team you played for, and that was the Toronto Raptors on February 22nd, uh, 2001. You were traded from the Pistons to the Raptors. Uh, it was you and Eric Montross coming on over. Can you relive the legendary story of you driving to Toronto uh, from Detroit after you found out that you had been traded? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I was in, uh, in shock as every NBA player is in, in, on their first trade. Um, the team told me that they weren't looking to trade me, um, the organization. And, and I, to get that call was just sort of like, 
wow, you just told me that I wasn't being traded. Um, but I didn't have any, it wasn't any like ill will towards Detroit or any fans there. It was just sort of like a, almost like a, a, a piece of you that's like, man, I, I, I'm leaving this here and all the things and relationships, you know, what what's to come of it. But then on the flip side, I was also telling myself, well, now I guess I'm, I'm a part of a new team, a new family, a new fan base. Uh, so I have to treat them the exact same way I treated the, the Detroit Pistons and all the Detroit fans and give them that same love and respect. And the first thing that I could think of was, you know, how soon can I get to practice? So it kind of came up organically because they started asking me about, you know, because it is a sensitive thing when you first get traded team wants to, you know, obviously give you a little bit of space to permit, uh, car, you know, uh, put, put everything in its proper box so you can, you know, uh, get acclimated to the new situation. And they were saying, Hey, you know, we're going to send you a, you know, send you, private plane to get you over here to Toronto just let us know when you're comfortable you know you obviously have two days to get here we'd love for you to get here as soon as you can but you know um and I said well okay um you know I can come tonight and then they said well because there's a snowstorm we can't send the plane out you know we'll send it to you first thing in the morning and I said well what time is practice and they said, well, practice is at nine, but you don't have to be at the practice because, you know, obviously you have two days to get here. And I said, well, nah, I'll see you at practice in the morning. I'll just drive. <laughs> and they were like, drive. <laughs> and they're like, you're going to drive tonight? I said, yep. Yeah. I said, just give me a few minutes, pack my bags, and I'll be, you know, hopping in the car. And that statement, I mean, it's, you know, it's crazy saying it now because because that's exactly what I said. And they were just like, wow. And then they, I was on almost, you know, I was on like the Fan 590 as I was on the road because they they use that as, a, you know, a PR. It was like yeah. first time ever any NBA player hopped in their car after a trade. And much respect to my Detroit Piston fans and everything else, but I was just doing exactly what I had done for them. I was always on time for work. I was always there. Um, I made sure my teammates understood I was, I was, you know, down for winning championships and I was going to do whatever I had to do to help lead the team and be there for the team. So that was just what I was taught and I was uh, ready to go to work. So there you have it, man. It was a snowstorm. It was like four feet of snow. Nah, <laughs> about six inches. <laughs> so, you know, but I got to the hotel and, uh, you know, teammates greeted me in the morning. That's amazing, Jerome. And as you can tell from my backdrop, I'm a huge Raptors fan. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your time here in Toronto and uh, your experience playing here in the city? Well, t Toronto is a very unique city. I love the city. Um, both of my daughters were born in Toronto. Uh, they're senior and junior in high school now, but they were born in Toronto. So that kind of dates me a little bit, but, uh, that's, uh, it, that's the, that's the love that I had for that city. I wanted my children born in Canada. Um, that's awesome. Because, because of the people there. So they are, they are, you know, dual citizens and they hold that with pride they they hold that with pride to this day and that's what it was like for me the people there the culture um you know i had no problem with with um part of my family being canadian and that said within itself says uh, you know what it needs to be said about you know the country about from coast to coast how i feel um, I got so many dog pound members. That's why I'm wearing my dog pound shirt for all my fans in Toronto. And, um, you know, that's where I feel like the dog pound came alive. So shout out to all my Canadian fans to this day, to this day. <laughs> that's awesome stuff. Jerome, what was your fondest memory playing with the Toronto Raptors? Well, definitely that series against Philadelphia. Um, 
you know, that playoff series was uh, – it would have been the New York series where we, we finally got out the first round of playoffs. But, um, you know, going up against my former roommate in college, Allen Iverson, the Philadelphia 76ers, um, the Kimbe Matumbo, also an alumni of Georgetown University, was very symbolic. You know, that was uh, – you know, it, it, it was reminiscent of – you know, Miami Heat versus New York, you know, Patrick versus Alonzo. And that was sort of like our, you know, myself and Alan's uh, sort of debut coming out party. And and I was I was just getting traded there, so I didn't get as many minutes as I probably, you know, um, would have gotten if I had been there the whole year. Um, but it was still, it was still a, the, the most fondest memories because there were a lot of great things, a lot of great plays um, in that series. And we were, you know, basically a shot away, a uh, point away, a basket away from winning and moving on and, and potentially moving on to play the Lakers and Kobe. So Kobe and Shaq. And that that's probably my fondest memory, it, that and uh, getting drafted. You know, you can't get into the NBA until you hear your name called. Um Obviously, there's other ways to get in, but that's the best way. And uh, when I got drafted, that was that was pretty pretty special. Jerome, I had uh, Alvin Williams on a few weeks ago. You, of course, played with him, Vince Carter, Charles Oakley, et cetera, et cetera. Who was the one guy you had a very strong relationship with during your time with the Raptors? Um, during my time with the Raptors, uh, you know, obviously I had a lot of friends on the team, you know, no no enemies, but – uh, probably Mo Pete, uh, because I remember in the when I was work playing with the Pistons and we worked out, uh, you know, Mo um, at the Pistons before he got drafted to the Raptors, and we ended up drafting Mateen Cleaves that year, um, his teammate, and they had won a championship together. Uh, but it was just fun playing with Mo. He was high energy. Uh, like myself, um, loved him shooting the threes and, and uh, you know, he was always fun, fun teammate to be around. He was always smiling and always, always upbeat. And, uh, you know, that was much like myself. Okay, I got to ask, Jerome, you're wearing the shirt. We all know you as the junkyard dog. It's always been on my mind since I've been a little kid. Where did your famous nickname come from? Well, you know, I got it when I was my rookie year with the Pistons. Rick Mahorn and Grant Long dubbed me that from the bench. And it really just boils down to this. You know, in, in the game of basketball, everybody wants to be a star. You know, when you come into the league, you know, everybody has, you know, the, the dreams and ambitions of, of being the scorer and being the guy. And – you know, I was really a late bloomer in, in high school, late bloomer in college. Um, and so I was, I've always felt like I was on a different ride and, and a different trajectory. And I was just so appreciative to be in, you know, on a team with Joe Dumars and Grant Hill and guys I kind of looked up to. And then obviously playing against, you know, guys like Michael Jordan and uh, Carl Malone and Charles Barkley, like, it was an honor, like, you know, you, you going up against the dream team, literally. Um, that those are that was my competition. And I felt like, you know what, they've been doing this longer. They've been here. I want to just learn from them, but not just learn from them. I want to help them be successful. And part of that was, you know, getting there early, you know, doing the little things, hard working. Um, making Joe Dumars and Grant look good. Well, how do you do that? Well, you set good screens. You you dive for loose balls. They can't be diving on the floor. You know they're, you know the the, the fans are paying to see them. They need somebody to do that. Well, I was I had my hand up like that's me. I, I'm I'm happy to do it. You know I'm glad to do it. Um, I'm glad to go in there and get the rebounds. I know it's hard in there. I know it's tough, but I'm quick. I'm strong. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get those rebounds for us. Get us, get us an extra possession here. There. I'm going to go after steals. I'm going to play good defense. I'm going to be there for you and take charges. And, you know, so those kinds of things, that's what got me the nickname. It was just being loyal to the group. Like they used to say, I used to guard the yard relentlessly. I wasn't going to, you know, give in. I wasn't 
looking for the accolades. I mean, think of a junkyard dog, right? He's a he he's he's the the forgotten dog. He's like the the dog that doesn't get any accolades, but he's there. He's he's there. He's consistent. He's you know he's he's never asking for anything extra. You know he doesn't need a steak. Throw him some kibbles and bits. <laughs> like that's that's me. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got the name. I wasn't looking for anything. I was just there to work hard and and do my job. You think that's missing from today's game? I mean, now you see guys playing, you know, the power four, the center position, chucking up threes, those nitty gritty tough guys. Uh, it, it seems like we had a lot more of those type of players back when, you know, you were playing when you first started your career. Do you think that's missing in today's NBA, those guys that just want to do the uh, little things for their team? Well, I think the game's evolved. I think that uh, now the games are, are, are more um, – you know, involving all the players and there's not as many specialists. Uh, there's not as many like pure shooters, like where, you know, this guy's open, he's making the shot, you know, that, you know, the Clay Thompson's and the Steph Curry's They're I mean, they're both on the same team and they're literally two of the best shooters in NBA history. Uh, and then when they had Katie as well, I mean, Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? Right. Um, back in the day, we had role players where you would have a specific shooter. Uh, we had Tracy Murray and Dell Curry uh, on the Raptors, right? But they needed, you know, other guys to do other things. And, and the new NBA is more like a universal, um, well, well-rounded well player where, you know, that gets kind of lost because – but, but the, the fun part about it is everybody's touching the ball. You know, a lot of things that they would always ask me in my career, why didn't you score more? You know, with the Raptors, I think the highest I was I ever averaged is almost 10 points a game and like eight or eight or nine rebounds. Well, it was it was a thing where, you know, my shooting percentage was for my career was above 50 percent. But at the end of the day, because of my role on the team, I wasn't necessarily looking at offense because I was so focused on the other things. I remember when I first was playing with the, um, with the Raptors and Lenny Wilkins, coach Lenny Wilkins would tell me, Hey Jerome, if you don't shoot the ball, I'm going to take you out the game. And that was like, you know, new to me. I'm like, this is new, new. You want me to really take my shots? And so my scoring went up. Um, and I just say all that to say is that everybody in the NBA can score. You know, when you get drafted, trust me you can you can go out there and do it you can fill it up but it's like you you also have to understand that you know it's a business and the players that they want to take the most shots will take the most shots and that's what you have to buy into and I didn't have any problem buying into that yeah no for sure uh Jerome as we know the NBA will be returning it will be a pandemic shortened season I just want to get your quick thoughts on uh on the news that the NBA will be coming back and who you see ultimately winning the championship under these circumstances? Well, you know, um, especially under the circumstances, uh, COVID hit, and then we had the social uh, issues with um, with police brutality and things of that nature that's hit. Uh, we're dealing with a lot down here and, um, you know, uh, praying for all the families involved on both sides. Um, it, it, it's... it's uh, it's a unique time and uh, the NBA has obviously stepped up. They were the first to announce that they'd be coming back um, because of the relationship that the owners have with the players. Um, now it goes a little deeper with obviously the significance of the cultural issues that have been embedded in the United States for a long time. So um, I, I just give you that as a, as a foundation for, you know, no matter how I feel about the NBA and what the season is, I'm just letting you know that that, that holds a little higher weight than the actual, you know, games. But that was your question. So I'm going to go into, I'm very excited. You know, if they do play, I'm very excited about that. I'm obviously like any other fan, like, man, can we get some basketball? Um, and I think that, you know, uh, Lakers and LA Clippers, Raptors and probably I would say Milwaukee um, were some of my top teams going into the playoffs. Um, Miami was sort of creeping up as well. 
um, in terms of the East Coast and, and where I was seeing that pan out. I think that, you know, the, the playoffs are going to be fun. You know, it gives, them, it gives teams eight games, you know, to really, you know, get in there and finish up the regular season uh, and prepare for the playoffs. But we all pretty much know because of the gaps that were already there um, who the top teams are. I'm glad Raptors are one of those teams. I think that they do have a solid chance of um, uh, of, of actually coming back and, and winning it. Um, guys like Marcus Gasol and, 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 you know, other, you know, Fred Van Lee, these guys were a little injured going into um, the tail end of the season. And having them healthy uh, is just going to be, you know, something to contend with. And I think that that's gonna that's gonna make a huge difference. It made a huge difference playing Milwaukee in the in the conference finals last year, and it's gonna make a huge difference this year. I think uh, Pascal Siakam is doing a great job, and I think that he uh, he really is uh, maturing as a player and becoming like you know that type of franchise type go to guy. And you know, the rest of the teams, I think, you know, LeBron James is LeBron James. He's got Anthony Davis, two of the best players in the NBA. Um, I think that their their weakest point is right now is their bench. Um, but having said that, you know, they might get DeMarcus Cousins back. Yeah. That's going to be a huge plus. You know, the Clippers, they have, they have a great bench. They've got a great starting five. Um, so, you know, with uh, Kawhi and and PG-13, Paul George, you know, they, they definitely have what it takes to win. So it's going to be exciting, I think. I think it's going to be fun to watch, um, and I'm looking forward to it, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Jerome, I want to talk now about your post-NBA career. Uh, let's start with your experience playing with the Big Three. How, how was that for you? Well, I mean, you know, I think it was a great experience just, just from the mere fact that uh, I, I definitely, you know, didn't see myself doing that. <laughs> I didn't see myself like uh, getting out there and, and, and playing any more professional basketball. I had a hard stop in 2005. Like most guys, you know, they kind of go overseas and they play a little bit, and they, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, hop around to a few other NBA teams I didn't do any of that. You know, in 2005, I shut it down. It was no more basketball. I almost came back to play for the Raptors. I also got offered by the Los Angeles Lakers um, and the Milwaukee Bucks. But the only people I really kind of considered were the Raptors and the Lakers. Um, Kobe was, uh, you know, still playing at the time, of course. And um, that was presented itself. But all in all, I, you know, I knew it was time for me. But, uh, you know, 2017, 12 years later, um, I get the call from Ice Cube. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, you know, hey, man, we're, you know, kind of getting this league together. And, and I was saying to myself, well, who's in, you know? <laughs> and he started saying some of the names. And I was just like, oh, that's going to be some fun right there. Dr. J, you know, Iceman, George Gervin. And, you know, Gary Payton, Rick Mahorn, they're all like coaching. And I'm like, well, this sounds pretty cool, you know. So um, I'm glad I did it. I was, I was happy to play. Um, my first year, you know, of course, Corey McGetty got our team captain, got hurt. So it was me and Katino Mobley pretty much the rest of this year with Deshaun Stevenson. And I had, I had shooters around me. So it was something that I was kind of used to. And, uh, you know, we make it to the playoffs, um, end up losing in the playoffs, we didn't have full strength. Uh, but the one thing I can say, I led the team in points, rebounds, and assists. So in the playoffs. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. And uh, Jerome, uh, you're now the president of the Young Three, which is the Youth Development League of the Big Three, which was developed by you. What gave you the inspiration uh, for this? And what are your ultimate goals with the league? Yeah, it was, you know what? Um, the inspiration just came from all the years of working with uh, students and youth uh, throughout the, the country, throughout Canada, and throughout the globe. You know, I did some stints of traveling with NBA Cares and um, Basketball Without Borders. So um, in all of my travels, I kind of took, took little things that I learned along the way and wanted to put it all into one package with the young three. And, 
and Ice Cube and Jeff Quatinus gave me the opportunity to just really, um, you know, uh, use all of my ideas. And Clyde Drexler is a commissioner, so he 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 had my back, and I and I just went in there with the uh, you know guns blazing and wanting to excite kids about the game of three on three. And uh, we partnered with Boys and Girls Club, and of course had uh, Adidas uh, really put up the dollars to do it. And we had some fun out there, you know, having all the staff, the NBA, ex-NBA players and WNBA players and Harlem Globetrotters, um, strategic, you know, it's never been done. And uh, I was glad to be a part of it and put it together and uh, looking forward to uh, some exciting years ahead of us. JYD, you're a big uh, ambassador within the community, a big advocate for, of course, the youth. What other initiatives do you got going on that the people should know it of? Man, shooting for peace, man, shooting for peace. You know, www.shootingforpeace.com is our website. And, uh, you know, it's been to Toronto. It's been all over. You know, it's been to several different countries, uh, but mostly in the United States where we deliver digital education, you know, African-American history, financial literacy, and mental health. I think, uh, you know, and that's to all students. Uh, you know, obviously we want to, try to make sure it hits a lot of the students with socioeconomic uh, low levels. Um, but it, we don't, we don't discriminate. We make sure it hits all cultures because it's important. And uh, as we can see in our climate today, you know, peace is needed. Um, it's an outcry for peace. Um, there's a public, you know, awareness of, of trying to, you know, uplift your fellow man. And that's what shooting for peace is all about. And it starts with the students, starts with the kids, starts with um, getting out there and, and, and volunteering and letting them know that education is important. Last, um, last year, our total of scholarships that we've handed out along um, partnership with HBCUs totaled $8.7 million. Wow. And I have a lot of board members from Toronto. Um, shout out to you know, uh, Jim Williams and Dale Lastman and people in Toronto, um, you know, uh, Jonathan from the NBA Canada offices, just just people who have been there and and supported me. You know the um, you know the ownership of the Raptors, Mister Mister Tannenbaum and, and his group. They, you know, they to this day they still make uh, donations in my name to Sick Kids Hospital, and uh, you know it's just people like that that really inspire me to you know, want to help the community and want to, you know, really do something meaningful and long lasting. Jerome, it really is awesome to see. I'm going to put a link down below for everybody to check out. Uh, you got so many great things going on and it's, it really is inspiring to see that, you know, post playing days, post uh, NBA career, you are doing something meaningful for everybody. So that is truly, truly remarkable. Jerome, I do have one last segment. I want to run with you quick. It's some rapid sure. fire questions. You ready, my man? I'm ready, man. Rapid fire. Let's get it. Let's do it. All right. First rapid fire question. Are you a morning or night person? Morning. Uh, which do you prefer, weights or cardio? Ah, cardio. Um, next one. What do you value more, time or money? Oh, time for sure. <laughs> Definitely time. What's money, these? money, money comes and goes. You need time, you know, you need time to make money. So if you, if you have time, that's, that's, uh, you know, you can't beat it. That's so true. That's, that's so true. And a lot more people need to start recognizing that. Um, what's the strangest object you've ever been asked to sign? Uh, <laughs> a nipple. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um if you could hop on a track with any artist who would it be definitely dmx Ooh, i like that your favorite cartoon of all time favorite cartoon of all time uh man the jetsons Wow. I, I forgot about that show. That was a solid show. Thank you so much, Jerome. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you doing the show. Uh, and uh, thanks so much, my man. I wish you all the best of luck with your future endeavors. And hopefully we can do this again soon.
Absolutely, man. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate you, man. Shout out to the dog pound. And Luke, and now you're in it. I love it. Thank you so much, Jerome. Guys, please like, subscribe, share, and I will catch you all again in my next video. Have yourselves a great weekend. Peace.